Hello all, welcome back to ATM5, Our Changing Atmosphere. In today's lecture, we're going to look at water in California so as to better understand how climate change will be having an impact on this diverse state. In today's lecture, we'll be defining water conveyance and groundwater overdraft. We'll be talking about how water is managed in California, how California's water resources will be impacted by climate change, and how water managers might react to climate change. To better understand the issues around water in California, we need to revisit the water cycle. The water cycle gives us an understanding of how water is brought to California and what happens to it once it arrives. Evaporation from the ocean surface brings water from the oceans into the atmosphere, where weather patterns are responsible for carrying it over land. Rising air cools and condenses, producing clouds and precipitation. In California, particularly in the wintertime, that rising motion is largely attributed to topographic uplift, that is, air that's blown against topography and forced to rise over top of it. Once precipitation forms, the temperature of the air will govern whether that pre precipitation falls as rain or snow. If the precipitation falls as rain, then the water will try to make its way downslope, potentially accumulating in streams, lakes, rivers, or as groundwater. Water can also evaporate on its way back to the ocean, prematurely entering back into the water cycle where it can again precipitate to the ground. If the precipitation falls as snow, it will accumulate temporarily in the form of snowpack, again re-entering the water cycle when temperatures rise high enough to trigger snowmelt. Vegetation also assists with the return of water to the atmosphere, as water uptake in plants can be transpired back to the atmosphere in a process analogous to human breathing. Groundwater is generally invisible to us on the surface, as it percolates through rocks and soil. Nonetheless, California has a substantial store of groundwater that has enabled California to manage during dry periods. Because of its present importance and potential future importance for water storage, we are going to touch again on groundwater in this lecture. Let's review some relevant facts about California. The state is one of the most biologically and environmentally diverse regions in the world. Its agricultural industry is essential to the whole nation, being responsible for approximately 50% of the nation's fruit and vegetable production, 80% of the world's almond production, and 35-40% to of the world's walnut and pistachio production. Agriculture in California has been successful because of the Central Valley's alluvial soil and sunny growing season. However, because of the lack of precipitation in the summer season, agriculture in California is largely supported by steady snowmelt from the wintertime snowpack. Both agriculture in California and statewide communities depend heavily on snow storage and well-timed natural snowmelt to satisfy demand. Nonetheless, California's meteorology is a story of extremes and natural variability. Winters are very wet and summers are very dry. However, Annual precipitation is also highly dependent on a few days of stormy weather. Approximately half of California's precipitation comes in only 5 to 10 days of rain each year. Consequently, there are huge differences in precipitation between years, referred to as interannual variability, attributed to changes in the number of days of stormy conditions. This means California is usually either experiencing too much rain or too little rain. California is rarely close to the average. When too much rain comes, at a, uh, comes, we are at high risk of flooding. When too little comes, California can quickly develop extreme drought. California is a big place and wildly diverse. Rainy montane regions in the north give rise to temperate forests. To the east, the high elevation of the Sierra Nevada is responsible for cool temperatures and consequently is home to much of the state's snowpack. The Central Valley, which stretches across much of the state, is dominated by agricultural activity and cropland, having been filled with nutritious sediments over millions of years of erosion. Finally, Southern California largely consists of desert and shrubland, with high temperatures and low precipitation. Precipitation, and hence water resources, in California are distributed unevenly across the state. The mountainous topography of Northern California, along with its proximity to the dominant track of, for mid-latitudinal storms, is responsible for the vast majority of the state's precipitation. However, the warm and sunny climate of Southern California has been a draw for the majority of the state's population. Consequently, there is a need to transport water from the north to the south in order to support those communities. Water is naturally routed through a vast network of rivers in the north of the state. 
In the Central Valley, the two biggest rivers are the Sacramento River and the northern, in the northern Central Valley and the San Joaquin River in the southern Central Valley. These are associated with the Sacramento and San Joaquin watersheds, respectively, and both drain through the San Francisco Bay Delta. A third river basin, the Tulare Basin, is in the far south of the Central Valley. Much of the water in this basin does not make its way back to the ocean, except during big rain events. Instead, it largely accumulates in the basin before being used by agriculture or evaporating. In Southern California, there are a few rivers that drain directly to the ocean, particularly closer to the coast. However, the Colorado River also demarcates the eastern edge of the state along the Arizona border, and its water has been artificially diverted for agriculture and communities in the region, as well as into San Diego. To support the water needs across the state, a vast support network has been engineered to carry water around the state. The infrastructure important for moving water around is referred to as water conveyance and includes canals, ditches, pipelines, and other means of moving water. One such example is depicted here in the bottom, the California Aqueduct, which winds along the western edge of the Central Valley from the Bay Delta. It has branches that convey water to Santa Barbara, Los Angeles, and San Bernardino. Other major projects include the Los Angeles Aqueduct, which carries water along the eastern flank of the Sierra Nevada from Owens Lake, and the San Diego Aqueduct, which carries water from the Colorado River along the southern edge of the state into San Diego. Besides conveyance, California water is also managed via water storage. There are three major mechanisms for holding water, including natural storage, surface reservoirs and conveyance infrastructure, and groundwater. Natural storage includes snowpack, lakes, and rivers. Surface reservoirs are artificial lakes built to contain water. And groundwater refers to water under the ground, primarily in regions of porous rock or sand, known as aquifers. Given the challenges in maintaining water supply in California, and the sharp contrast between seasons, all these methods are heavily utilized in managing California's water. Given the importance of water to the state of California, it's no surprise that there is a complicated legal framework set up to determine who controls particular water sources. The system was designed early in California's history, and consequently is not without its share of controversy in the modern age. The system of water rights is designed to guarantee certain landowners access to available water on or adjacent to their land. A riparian right comes with owning a parcel of land adjacent to a water source, and guarantees the owner first access rights to that source. The Department of Water Resources also manages a system which allows water to be diverted for particular purposes, which are known as appropriative rights. Given the importance of water within California, it's no surprise that attempts to modify water rights are highly contentious and considered politically intractable. Nonetheless, there is widespread awareness that water rights are highly dependent on the amount of precipitation received, which can vary significantly on a year-to-year -year basis. In fact, along many rivers and in many basins, the allocated water rights are often in excess of 100% of available water in a given average year, which can be contentious, particularly in dry years. Over the next century, California will need to adapt its water management strategies in the face of climate change. To the right here, we can see anticipated changes to temperature and precipitation over the next century, as predicted by an ensemble of climate modeling systems. These systems suggest temperatures in California will rise by 3 to 6 degrees Celsius by end of century, or 5 to 11 degrees Fahrenheit. The warmer temperatures will increase the amount of water vapor in the air and consequently drive up precipitation in the northern half of the state. The drier southern half of the state is actually expected to experience a decline in precipitation in accordance with the well-known climate rule of thumb, wet becomes wetter and dry becomes drier. Precipitation in California is notoriously volatile year to year, which makes it difficult to pick up on these trends. That is, there is a signal to noise problem. The interannual variability is noise, and the climate trend is the signal. With that said, the Sacramento drainage does show a slight uptick in precipitation over the past century, while the southeast desert basins have seen a decline. The total change in average California precipitation is on the order of 5% per degree Celsius of warming. If you would like to explore more of these precipitation time series, you can check out the NOAA's climate, National Climate Data Center at the link provided here. Although historic precipitation amounts have largely held steady, snowpack has been steadily declining. According to the Environmental Protection Agency, from 1955 to 2016, April snowpack has declined across the Sierra Nevadas 
almost everywhere, amounting to a 23% decline in average annual snowpack. The lowest elevations have seen the greatest decline because their temperatures are naturally just below freezing. Climate change has been responsible for pushing these temperatures just over the threshold, transforming snow to rain. However, to date, snowpack has not declined significantly at higher elevations. The plot shown here from the National Climate Assessment, Chapter 8 in 2017, shows projected changes in winter, that is, December, January, February, snow water equivalent, at the middle and end of century under the high emissions scenario. This method is used in order to project how snowpack in the U.S. West will be changing over the next century. The simulations indicate that by 2050, we expect a further loss of 22% of total Sierra Nevada snowpack compared to today. By 2100, this loss increases to 89%. At the end of the century, we expect there to be very little snowpack available to act as a natural mechanism for storing water. Although the average annual runoff through the Sacramento River has largely unchanged over the past century, the seasonal trend of that runoff has changed significantly. We have been seeing far less spring runoff, that is, water passing through the river from April through July, and an increase in winter runoff, that is, from November through March. This is again the result of those warmer wintertime temperatures working against snowpack accumulation, meaning more rain is falling in the winter season and less snow. With less snow, there is also less snow melt, and so reduced flows in the Sacramento in the spring season. The result is less water available during spring, and particularly notable being that this is the growing season, and a greater need for water to be manually stored from the winter season. The shifting seasonality of runoff is also clear in this plot, which shows the approximate runoff by month in the Sacramento. Over the course of the 20th century, the Sacramento River runoff peak has shifted from peaking in April to peaking in March, about a month earlier. This trend towards an earlier runoff peak, that is, the month of maximum runoff, appears consistently in watersheds throughout the U.S. West. This tendency towards less wintertime snowpack drives increased water seasonality in California, namely more water available in winter and less in summer. The consequences of this are suggestive of a retreat of montane forests as they cannot persist over increasingly dry summers. It turns out that this increased seasonality is further enhanced by changes in weather patterns. Using climate model data, a recent study by Daniel Swain and others has shown that the thermodynamics of air also promise to drive an increase in seasonality over the coming century. Namely, the wet becomes wetter, dry becomes drier paradigm applies to seasonality as well. California's summers are dry and promise to become drier. California's winters are wet and promise to become wetter. This change is enhanced the farther south one goes. This chart on the right shows a graph of enhancement as a function of month and latitude. In general, enhanced precipitation is expected in December through February and declines in April through October. Now that we've discussed how water is managed in California, and some of the issues related to water in the coming century, let's consider how water managers are responding to these challenges. First, we can look at surface reservoirs, a key component of California's water management system. In total, surface reservoirs at present are responsible for storage of 42 million acre-feet, or MAF, of water, or approximately 13.7 trillion gallons. One possible solution to declining snowpack and increased seasonality is simply to build more surface reservoirs. However, this is a difficult proposition. The locations of these reservoirs have already been optimized for minimizing cost and environmental impact. Additional reservoirs face issues of diminishing returns. There are few good places to locate them, and those places where they could be built do not offer significant additional storage to account for the cost of their construction. Although surface reservoirs offer 42 million acre feet of water storage, another sometimes overlooked reservoir sits beneath our feet. Namely, California's subsurface aquifers are estimated to have the potential to hold around 140 million acre feet, although the di exact amount is difficult to ascertain. Nonetheless, our groundwater aquifers have already been heavily used for the past century. Between 1920 and 2013, approximately 125 million acre-feet of groundwater, or around 41 trillion gallons, have been drained from the Central Valley aquifers to support agriculture. Refilling these aquifers with natural seepage would require approximately 50 years. 
These withdrawals have become even more severe over the recent 2012 through 2016 California drought. NASA's GRACE satellite was recently launched to estimate changes in groundwater content worldwide by measuring its gravitational pull. Here we see that over the past 20 years, it has picked up on a substantial decline in California Central Valley groundwater. This is perhaps no surprise, as in the absence of snowpack and surface water, farmers have turned to groundwater reserves to meet their needs. Before the introduction of the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act in California in 2014, also known as SIGMA, these groundwater water withdrawals were largely unregulated and unsustainable. However, SIGMA intends to ensure our groundwater withdrawals are sustainable into the future. That is, our withdrawals do not exceed our deposits. As mentioned before, these withdrawals have been particularly significant during dry periods in California's history. As can be seen on this 60-year record of groundwater loss, the added groundwater during wet periods has not been enough to compensate for withdrawals during dry periods. The water now being withdrawn from the California Central Valley aquifers is increasingly coming from deeper and deeper underground. Today, water is being pumped that is over 20,000 years old. That is, it first percolated into the soil 20,000 years ago. The most significant pumping has come from the Tulare Basin in the south southern Central Valley. This is a region that is largely desert but is dominated by agriculture because of its warm temperatures and sunny days. Agriculture in this region is sustained by a heavy reliance on pumped water. The effect is striking, with a dramatic reduction in groundwater found in this region. This is a concerning trend, particularly as we don't have a good understanding on how much water remains in these aquifers. Elsewhere in the Central Valley, the pumping has been far less severe. Nonetheless, we've seen some reductions in the San Joaquin Basin and an increase in groundwater in the Sacramento Valley. Increased groundwater pumping runs the risk of triggering groundwater overdraft. Groundwater overdraft is analogous to a bank account overdraft, referring to pumping more groundwater than the system can reasonably sustain. The possible consequences of this include unsustainable storage depletion, ground subsidence, surface water and ecosystem effects, such as drying of streams that are above the water table, and increased energy costs. Also, these withdrawals have been steadily increasing the amount of salt in Central Valley groundwater as a consequence of water intrusion from depth, basin salt imbalance, and seawater intrusion, not to mention industrial pollutants seeping into the soil. The biggest concern with groundwater overdraft is what to do when we run out of groundwater. We don't per have particularly accurate measurements of how much groundwater is present in the Central Valley. So continued withdrawals have the possibility of exhausting our groundwater supply and devastating our agricultural industry and rural communities. The effects of groundwater overdraft are hard to see because the groundwater is largely invisible to us. However, one way we can see it directly is through ground subsidence or the sinking of the ground as underground aquifers are pumped dry and collapse. A famous photo from the Tulare Basin on the right here shows the magnitude of subsidence between 1925 and 1977, as measured by the U.S. Geological Survey. Ground subsidence has been most severe in the southern half of the Central Valley, with some regions experiencing subsidence of 8.5 meters or more, uh, or more over the 20th century. It is estimated that about 18 million acre-feet of storage was permanently lost because of subsidence. So how can future water management challenges be met in California? There are many strategies that need to be pursued in unison, including institutional mechanisms for affecting change in management, the adoption of quantitatively ground, grounded decision-making under uncertainty, societal changes in water priorities, and new strategies for dealing with uncertainty and long-term risks. California has made great strides with the adoption of SIGMA legislation, but further actions are necessary to ensure we have sufficient water in an increasingly uncertain future. A key question that arises is, where will the socioeconomic motivation and resolve come, to, from, uh, come from to enact these changes? And for that, I think education is key. Okay, that's enough for today. That wraps up our discussion of water challenges under climate change. Continuing with this thread in the next lecture, we'll be talking about how climate change may be impacting weather patterns and meteorology.